Hi, welcome to this evening's Blended Learning PLC. Um, we're going to focus today on reflection from last year, what worked well, and what challenges do you need to overcome? I'm Tamara Tondrick. I'm the Executive Director of Operations from Beacon Academy of Nevada. And joining me this evening is Brian. Yep, and I'm currently the coordinator of uh, K-12 Digital Learning Technology in Clark County School District. So what we're going to do is just kind of talk about some of the, the big aspects of, of blended learning and reflect back on this, this past year. on What worked well and, and what challenges did we have to overcome? Um, we were hoping this is going to be more of a, of a discussion with, you know, school leaders and talk about specific sites. I um, mean, some of the things that went well and some of the things that they overcame and try to learn from each other. Um, so we'll talk through this, Tammy and I, um, from our perspectives, uh, myself from the central office at Clark County and Tammy from uh, the Beacon Academy. And so one of the first things that blended learning really helps solve, not just necessarily last year, but moving forward, is it helps with learning loss or accelerating learning. Um, learning loss became this really big buzzword through the pandemic because all the, but but it's there every year. Um, there's gaps created every year when um, uh, learning has taken place uh, in classrooms, right? Students daydream, like that's learning loss, right? They're they're absent for a vacation. They're they're absent for uh, emergencies in the family. So those things are always going to be there, um, and so blended learning can help solve those things. Um, and and then. When there is loss, there's that need to accelerate it the next year to reduce to reduce those gaps. Um, and so that's one of the things that um, we're excited about with what blended learning can do. So what worked well, what challenges around that uh, happened last year, Tammy? Yeah, um, as a member of the Digital Learning Collab, um, I had the opportunity last year to work with administrators, teachers, um, we even had some panels where students joined us and they told us, you know, some of the things that they enjoyed, um, some of the things that worked really well, and then challenges that they were working through. So in addition to speaking from the perspective of, you know, just one school or in the charter community, um, I will be sharing some of the information and points of view that I was able to participate in through the um through the digital learning collaboration last year. And so um, the students in particular, that was an interesting panel and they shared that they did like obviously learning from home. Um, many of the students that participated really felt that they liked, they liked going at their own pace, reading the material and learning on their own. There were other students, you know, with different perspectives because one size doesn't fit all um, because that was a completely online format last year. Some of the students shared that they they missed being in the classroom and the teacher, which which is why the blended learning is is a much better approach when you're using digital you know curriculum and content. You still need that face to face and that instruction. And so, uh, several of the school districts in the north. In, in Washoe County in particular, were implemented blended learning and they were really excited about what they were seeing in the classrooms, that the students were engaged, um, they were learning at their own pace. Um, and, and so they were, they, they were pretty excited by it. Nice, and I think that leads big into the next one with the student engagement, um, especially when we look at over um, the pandemic, I think it was really easy for students to disengage, right? We saw a lot of complaints of cameras were off and and, and not there. Um, it, they, you know, teachers just talking to emojis um, essentially, and so that was a big struggle here in Clark. Um, and I think you know, you hit the nail on the head. You know, moving forward, being able to leverage blended learning, where now you do have some of that face to face time with the students, can really minimize that so we can maximize uh, the uh, the positives of digital learning, um, because we do see them face to face, we can have them engaged. Um, and that was, you know, where 
I think the bulk of our focus is going to have to be here in Clark moving forward is around the professional learning and how do I keep students engaged when they are in a digital learning experience. What about what about you? Any extensions there? No, for sure. I mean, um, the school that I'm in is is a blended learning school. We've been operating as a blended learning school since 2014. So this wasn't new. And so we find that the most the, the most critical point, all of our data, when we um, first entered the pandemic and the students were completely online, all of our numbers um, dropped, our student performance numbers, um, our attendance decreased. Students really um, disengaged from school. We're back this year to a, a full blended program. Last year we ran it modified where students had the option to come to school. This year it's back to being a required, it's our program and our numbers are once again climbing. Our pass rates are better, our students are earning more credits already and um, are much more engaged. And we just um, did a survey and the students very, very um, favorably they, they really like the program. They like learning at their own pace, but having a teacher in the room to help them through those places where there may be gaps in their learning, mm -hmm. where they just don't get it. And um, it's also just nice, uh, you know, that one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher just to go through, help them set goals, motivate them. All right, awesome. And so then when we start talking about the content that's available with, with blended learning, one of the huge struggles that we had in, here in Clark, especially at the very beginning, was there wasn't a lot of content for everybody. We had a, a, a solid repository for some of our core 6 to 12 um, that had been developed at the district level. Uh, but our electives, um, our CTE programs, our K-5, there wasn't a lot. Um, with the uh, ESSER money that came in, that was one of the things that started to be more available. Um, the state purchased some things like discovery, some like supplemental comp, uh, content, but nothing that was true courseware um, that we think of at, at the secondary level that's available K-5. And so that was a really big challenge. And then the other thing is that that came in when we did get it, the challenge was how do we provide uh, effective professional learning around this so that our teachers A, know it's there and B, know how to use it effectively. So those were those were the things, but actually having more content was was a big positive. Yeah, um, I would agree. Con content is is critical when you're teaching online, and um, you and I both have had experience as curriculum designers, so we do understand the challenges and the time it takes to build really good curriculum, but. What you will find and, and what I was excited to see and hear about in um, the Digital Learning Club were how many teachers were embracing that. They were using, um, you know, videos that they could find. They were building even, even web quests, things like that, where the students were going through and answering questions from websites. So there is ways you know, there is a way to do it. It just is time consuming and it's just something that you um, need to spend each year. It will get better. So if it's not perfect this year, that's okay because you're just going to get student feedback and you can build upon it and you can make improvements as you go through. And I think that's important too, is just Consider it just like, you know, you're you're a first year teacher and every year or every period you get better and better. And, and that's what happens when you build your lessons online. But what I'm really happy to hear is that a lot of people are still using the curriculum and content they built last year in their classes this year. And they're really enjoying that, having the face to face part of it. And then their students are still able to go home and, and do assignments online so that less time in the classroom is spent on worksheets and things like that. And more time is being spent on, you know, those more critical aspects of class like labs and different activities that they can do. Awesome. Yeah. So then the, the next thing that it leads into is technology. And so one of the things that we're excited about here in Clark is for the first time, since I've gotten here in, in 07, we're, we have devices and connectivity to every student. 
So if they don't have connectivity at home, we have mobile hotspots that they can uh, request. Um, every kid can request a Chromebook. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting time um, to be in digital learning um, here in Clark because that the old adage of, well, I would love to try this, but I, my kids don't have it when they leave um, is, is taken away, right? We've solved that problem. Um, now the challenge with that again comes with professional learning. So you're gonna hear me say that probably a lot because that's the focus of my job. Um, but we have some teachers that don't know how to effectively use email. And now they've been given all this technology in their students, and we're going to be asking them to start incorporating it more in, in the classroom. Uh, and so it's not only just the point and click of how the technology works, but the pedagogy that goes along with it is our biggest challenge. Yeah, I would agree. Um, we have definitely embraced all of the grant funds that we've re received through ESSER. And I mean, it, it's a fantastic time to have all this technology and the students are being able to use hotspots. So that's all fantastic. And, and I agree with you, um, preparing teachers to use the technology and teach the technology and then also being able to troubleshoot is, um, is, is, is very challenging for people that haven't spent a lot of time online. And so, yeah, that, that, is, that is a piece that we will continue to work on. And, and that definitely goes in the challenges column. Yeah, for sure. And then when we take a look at uh, more of a, the pedagogy, like what is personalized learning and how do I teach that way? Um, the biggest challenge that we have is kind of taking what, what worked well last year, if anything, and building on that for, for the years to come. And so it's, it's really easy for, for schools and leaders and teachers to say, well, I don't want to do anything on the computer anymore because, because of COVID, right? Or because of the pandemic and that teaching just did not work for me. I just want to go back to, to the way that I'm used to, but we don't want to necessarily do that. We want to say, okay, we, like you mentioned earlier, I have all, I spent all this time with these lessons. How now can I maximize their potential when I'm seeing the kids five days face to face? And so, and that's really where personalized learning can come in. Because now when we start to, all right, let me give you a, a lesson to help uh, relearn this topic um, before you fail the course, right? So there's a, and then there's an opportunity to earn the right to reassess, which is super exciting. Yes, um, I have so many things to say on, on this topic and it's just hard to decide where to begin, but, um, Personalized learning is is fantastic. When you walk into a school that's implemented blended learning and you see the students are all on their own devices and in one classroom, I have 20 students on 20 different lessons, maybe even in different, let's say, levels of English, if I'm in an English class, the, the teachers really are personalizing that learning. They've, they're identifying, they can look at the data, they can identify where the students are in the class, which lessons they're on. They can um, spend a lot of time coaching those students to what are your goals for today? Where are you going to reach? And then identifying those places where they're really struggling so they can sit down and have those conversations. And what I love to see um, I, I love listening to the conversations between the students and the teachers because so much is being assessed verbally, you know, where, where they're having a conversation and they can see where the student is and then they can help them. So um, watching them develop, take ideas and helping the student, you know, extract those ideas from their minds. And what are you going to put on the paper? How are you going to organize this? You know, it, it's just fun to watch. And um, it's it's really neat to see the students grow because they the students are all at different levels. And so they can all use some instruction. And so much of that is missed when we're teaching, you know, to a teaching the same lesson, that direct instruction. So it really is a great opportunity to teach um, the way you think, you know, when like a tutor teaches where it's one-on-one, -on -one, you really know where the student is. And yet you can do this in a classroom full of students because they're all busy working on their assignments. So it's, um, 
it's it's a great opportunity now that we have the technology the content you've you know the teachers have started to build it last year they're just expanding on those ideas so um yes there are a lot of challenges but um i think a lot worked really well last year and and maybe not everybody realizes it. they've built a foundation now they're they're able to move forward from that point point. Uh, and we and we kind of uh, broached this topic a little bit before with engagement and, and ownership is, is really close to that but it's a little bit more like student-centered um, and one of the core aspects of blended learning is, is allowing the students to have some choice in their learning um, which helps transfer that ownership and then sharing the the, the data that's going along with the, the reason that they are experiencing this type of lesson versus another type of lesson, um, why they're getting pulled into small group. All of that helps uh, drive the, the idea that the students need to own their own learning. Um, and, and then that leads to more choice. And, and, uh, and that was extremely challenging because I think for teachers is the biggest shift, is understanding, all right, how do I do this? You know, the old adage of, well, you can lead a horse to water doesn't necessarily work anymore, right? Like this, we're, we're trying to develop some uh, more robust drinking fountains, I guess, right? For, for the students um, so that they can be more engaged in, and start taking that uh, that ownership, making the water a little bit more appealing with some good. You cut out there for a second. Um, oh, sorry. Just, just your last word, sentence, I wasn't sure if you were done, but, um, I would agree. Student ownership is um, is basically where you get the student buy-in. And um, one of the tools we've used forever, you know, in the classroom that transfers real easy to the online is giving them choices. What 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 can they do to answer the question? Can they? submit something where they're just speaking does it have to be an essay can they put together a powerpoint so giving them choices in the way they present their knowledge to demonstrate their understanding um, having them online allows them to pick and choose the time they're working although you do have due dates when they need to be submitted but but it does allow them to have some ownership and um, just that buy-in when, when they're going through that class, where can you, where are you comfortable giving some leeway? Where can you allow the students to lead through sections? You know, you, you have to set the parameters, but but how how much wiggle room is there in that lesson? And that um, that does increase again student engagement because they're they're more in control. And as as everybody knows everyone likes to be in control of their own you know work and materials and things they're doing so we're going to talk a little bit about the the SWOT analysis and um one of the reasons that i'm bringing you know we decided to bring this up and share this with you is this is a really good tool that you can consider using with your administrative team, your school board, your school improvement team. And if you aren't familiar with a SWOT analysis, um, this can be used to identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Brian and I had planned to do this with all of, you know, everyone who attended. And so what we had wanted to do in this section was find out from the team, you know, what were the strengths in their schools, in their districts, so that we would have um, more of more input than just the two of us from our observations. And so um, the SWOT analysis is just, it should be used to understand the strengths and weaknesses of your school, opportunities that might be available and threats that we may face. You use a SWOT analysis to identify critical issues for your organization, the weakness and the threats, and explore strategies for improvement. So as I said, Ryan and I are going to work together and complete a SWOT analysis, or at least walk you through this so that you can do this with your teams back in your school. And again, we are. Uh, this is focused on blended learning. This isn't 
your whole school improvement. This is blended learning. And for Brian and I, we're going to talk about the blended learning SWOT analysis in Nevada. We're not going to speak to um, any particular school or district. Um, we'll do our best to um, think outside the box and think about what's going on throughout the state. This should be fun, Brian. Here we go. Yeah, be fun. <laughs> if we're wrong, just tell us in the comments. <laughs> You can stay after. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we'll start with blended learning strengths. So um, we have some guiding questions for you to think about with your teams in your school. And then Brian and I will just share some insights, you know, from across the district and, and um, state. Obviously, it's just the viewpoint of two. So I'm sure there's many things that we will forget or not know about and not be able to mention. But when you think about the strengths, you know, it's what went well last year. What did your school do best in regards to blended learning? If you're a teacher, what did you do best in your classroom to implement blended learning? What advantages did your school have, your blended learning program have over others? I can tell you my school had a huge advantage. We already had curriculum online and we were already set up for blended learning. So this wasn't a challenge for our school. What was a challenge, a small challenge was, was transitioning to fully online. And so you have to think about your school. Um, what does your school better do better than other schools? What resources do you have available? Brian just mentioned, you know, we now have Chromebooks. We now have digital hotspots for students who don't have technology. What do you have in your school? How is your classroom set up? Do you have technology? What type of projectors, smart boards, um, media centers? Um, what makes your blended learning program unique from others? Um, and what would you say your school community thought was your strengths? And what do your staff members think of as your strengths? And so those are just some questions to think about it. And it's um, important to think about it from both, you know, the internal perspective and then the external perspective. Um, somehow, I think there was a disconnect between parents and student perspective and the educators, you know, as we went through the pandemic. Um, yes, everybody was stressed and overworked and doing things they'd never done before. But but I do think that um, that was a question that I know I could have, you know, at, for my own school or speaking from districts, I think that's a question we all could have asked. How, how does the external perspective differ from the internal perspective. Um, Brian, you have anything to add here? No, I think I think you did a, a really great job. I think one of the things that I coming out of this that went well last year is as a state now, we have a, a learning management system that is consistent from pre-K through 13. If you if you've at least here in Clark, right? And I know the state has made Canvas available for for K-12 students. Um, and and so, I think they're using it in higher ed as well. They are, yeah, UNR yeah. and UNLV are all in, in Canvas as well, Truckee Meadows. Um, so I think, you know. Yeah, it's great. And, and uh, Toro is the only one that's like half and half, right? Where I think some of their courses are in Canvas. I, I, don't, I don't know what percentage, so I should, you know, what half and half is, it's not the 50-50, but chances are if our students are staying in state and, and moving into their uh, into college, whether it's community college or at the university level, um, they're going to experience Canvas as a student. So having that there and then also, you know, the huge transiency that we have here in Clark, uh, it's nice that doesn't matter where that student moves through throughout the valley, but that that management system is going to be the same now, um, whatever classroom they, they enter, which is really, really exciting. That is, that's a great point. All right, so then the next part of the SWOT is the uh, blended learning weaknesses. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what didn't go well. Um, and there are a few uh, questions um, that you can help guide this conversation. 
you know, what are the disadvantages that your school program has compared with other schools? Um, what could be improved in that blended learning program? And then, you know, I, I talked about professional learning a lot. So looking at the weaknesses, what knowledge, talent, skills, um, and resources are they lacking? Um, and then that way you can help shore those, those up with a professional learning plan. Um, and then, uh, you know, what uh, are the people in the community likely to see as a uh, weakness in the program? So, and that, that's a really uh, big one when we start talking about, you know, Tammy mentioned earlier, the parent perspective versus educator pr perspective. And that's gonna be a big um, hot topic coming forward when they, when teachers say, hey, we're gonna do some learning on the computer, especially with a lot of the negative uh, feedback and, and negative experiences that a lot of students had in the pandemic. And then, um, what factors are, are gonna cause you to lose enrollments or what complaints did you receive last year? So again, all of that information is gonna help uh, inform um, what you need to do for next steps in implementing the blended learning program. Do you wanna add anything there, Tammy? Again, I think you did a good job. Um, I, I just, it's disappointing um, that the pandemic caused this, you know, the the moving online to happen in such a large scale that it gave such a bad impression. I have been in online education, I think it's forever now, but um, I've been working in online education, I think since 2006. And it has so many great, great um, advantages, not, you know, advantages, not necessarily better, than being in the classroom, but there are there are really good pros about online and blended education that didn't get to be showcased because of the time factor. When you look at programs that transition to blended, it usually takes three to five years and everybody had to do it you know, they just had to pivot midstream and have it going in a week. And that is not how it should have been implemented. So I understand the, the fear, the, the, the reluctance to move in this direction, but that is not how it should have been done. And, and so I really hope that um, that doesn't turn people off to this type of education and the opportunities that can be provided for, you know, that, that, that we can use it and, and do and educate students. Um, it just isn't supposed to happen overnight. And so if you're reluctant to go about that, just keep that in mind. This is something you can transition into very slowly and, and get the infrastructure in place so that when you do roll it out, it will go smoothly. Well, and, and I'm, I'm thinking back to what you said earlier, the advantage that, that your school had where you already were implementing blended learning. I think we can learn a lot from that in understanding how different teaching in the pandemic was because it, it was, that was a struggle even for a school set up for blended learning going fully online because mm -hmm. it is a totally different animal where it's a lot easier for those students to hide from you. And so there's different approaches that you need to take for for student engagement and for parent involvement than there is when you have um, that advantage of them coming in multiple days a week. And so looking at that, I think that we can learn a lot from that and be hopeful that, all right, when we start doing things now, how do we leverage that face-to-face -face time to set them up for success, not only when we see them, but when they're doing stuff uh, at a distance. Right, and you mentioned, you know, the talent and skills and resources in the school. Well, a school like mine, I've been able to develop those talents and train our staff how to use the gradebook in Canvas, how to set up their, you know, how to set up everything. So all of that was already taken care of where, um, you know, other teachers across the state did not have that professional development. I'm talking seven years of professional development. This is not... This is a different style of teaching, and there really is a lot of technical components to it. And just like everyone, we continue to grow and learn each year too. And so it's not like you get one training in blended learning and voila, you're, you know, you're this great 
fantastic blended learning teacher. It takes years, it takes practice, and it, it takes tools and the skill to use those tools and even more so troubleshoot when your students are having trouble. So um, I really hope that um, educators remember that what was done last, you know, through the pandemic happened overnight where we would never do that when implementing a new program ever. You know, it, it just, it was an unfortunate way that many people were introduced into online and blended education. Yeah, agreed. So opportunities, I'll take this one. So how, this, this one is really what opportunities can we exploit from implementing, improving a blended learning program? So how can you turn your strengths into opportunities? So if you have some staff members who did a fantastic job, maybe you can have them develop a professional development. Start small, start with, you know, people that are interested in learning. Um, this doesn't have to be, you know, every single classroom has to do the same thing. It's, it's definitely taking those strengths and turning them into opportunities. How do you take your weaknesses and turn it into opportunities? Again, we just talked about professional development. We talked about the time. Um, we, we, we know that you don't need to implement a blended learning program in the next three minutes, you know, and so you can take that time. Your team and your school can start talking about the implementation, set your annual goals. Where do you want to be five years from now? Um, is there a need in your, in, in your school that no one is meeting? So is there something that you're doing um, that's meeting a need that other schools aren't doing? Um, and what could you do today that isn't being done? So think about um, your school, your district. Um, there's, there's many things that we, we, could, we could begin with um, that aren't being done right now. Um, how is your field changing and how do you take advantage of those changes? And, you know, one of the interesting things is, is with, with distance education, the colleges are, are still, many, many of their classes are still online. So if you're teaching at the high school level, you really are preparing your students to be college students. So that's an opportunity that, that you can promote to parents. They need to learn how to use these LMSs. As Brian just said, they're, they're being used at University of Reno, UNLV, CSN. Like they're using these, they're using the same learning management system. If your students are familiar with it and comfortable with it, they're going to do that much better in school because there's this learning curve when you go for, in an online platform. You first have to, have to learn how to use it before you can start learning the content. So um, what is that opportunity? And, um, I, you know, what, what's missing from the school community that might be an opportunity? Um, what weaknesses can we eliminate? So those are some blended learning opportunities that you can think about within your own school. Um, and, and really it's taking a look at what your strengths, what did you do well, taking a look at your weaknesses, what didn't you do well, and, and, and how do you turn those into opportunities? And um, th there's a lot of smart people in every school and a lot of talented people and a lot of motivated people. And it's just, you know, it's, it's giving them an opportunity to um, lead and shine. Yeah, I think this is like the why, right? Like, the, mm -hmm. you know, educators need a reason to, to shift. Right. So developing these opportunities is, is, is finding that why you, you want to, whether it's, hey, we have really large class sizes and, and you feel disconnected to your students. Maybe blended learning is hey, we can personalize the learning for your students. You'll get to know them a little bit better, even with large class sizes, because now we can create these learning experiences that are in smaller groups um, without sacrificing the instructional time because of the other um, activities that we're able to uh, provide for our, for our students. Uh, so that to me is is the the really the goal of this section is coming up with a why that's going to work for you and your staff. 
right, and then next is uh, threats. All right, so what are the things that, that could derail the, the shift to, to blended learning? Um, and so when we start looking at it, what are the obstacles that we're going to face? Um, so we know our strengths, we know our weaknesses, we've talked about the opportunities or the whys. What are, what's going to prevent us from getting there? Um, are, are those in reevaluate the weaknesses and say, are any of those going to be big areas that we need to address right away that are going to prevent it? Um, is this going to be a, uh, a creating new problems in the future that we can maybe identify and, and look to avoid creating those problems before we even get started? Um, and then what are the standards or policies or legislation um, that are in place? Are they going to be changing that's going to impact this in a negative way? Um, are there any threats to, from the school community um, that may uh, affect, uh, affect the uh, viability? You know, whether it's financial, uh, is it the infrastructure, what other things that schools in the neighborhood are doing? Um, and then what dangers are going to uh, be potentially exposed to the school from changing this uh, uh, from go government policy changes or, or, in, or the community or things like that. And then what are the risks? So identifying those risks that you could face uh, during this as well. And then game planning around how to, how to minimize those risks. Yeah, that all sounds, that's great, Brian. I, I don't really have anything to add there. I think those are great questions. Um, and I, I was trying to go through, you know, as you're asking those questions, like what to provide examples and things like that. And, and I think the obstacle we face now is really all the negative that came out of online learning during the pandemic. Um, because I think I think the schools that were able to do the blended learning, like the the northern counties, um, you know, Washoe County, they they were able to get the students back, and I think the perception there is a lot more open to doing this again. Um, and around the nation, there are pockets of you know places that really did it well, but um, for schools that stayed strictly online. Um, there, there is some negative, just negative publicity from it. There was a lot of negative press on that. And the students, it, it really wasn't great for the students. And um, a lot of students just stopped learning, stopped participating. They disengaged in school. And so I think that's really the largest threat. So changing the perception and showing that you can embrace technology in the classroom while the students are in the school um, and is is all an important part of how we start overcoming that yeah absolutely and i think you know speaking to what you said earlier you know one of the weaknesses is we all had to jump into the deep end altogether yeah. and so understanding hey if, if a threat may be going school wide right away. So taking something like a pilot program with some teachers to just provide a proof of concept. So getting those teachers in and, and hey, let's let's try this approach and see how it goes. And then those can be become part of the professional learning for the entire staff the following year. So going back to that three to five years, right? We start with a pilot, start small, get their proof of concept, hey, this actually works, learn from our mistakes in, in, in that program before we expand to, to school-wide. And even even smaller than that, they can you can do uh, lessons, you can do a unit. Um, there are so many different ways to implement blended learning. And um, so much of it can happen right in the classroom. And so um, it's, just, it's just taking what we've learned and taking that those weaknesses and, and really implementing it. But like you said, let's give it some time. Let's do it right this time and let's get our teachers ready. We've got the resources now. So um, it's, it's just taking the time to do it properly. Awesome. So the next steps, so the next steps in, in your school should be, um, you know, 
to do the SWOT analysis with your team and then decide what you need to do next to, to implement blended learning in your school. And it may be that you need to start with professional development, which is always a great place to start. Get the teachers ready, get your buy-in, get the team's input so that it can be done. Um, if you're not ready to do it at your school, then I, I do, I like what Brian recommended that you either pilot it in certain content areas or with certain teachers or even a smaller scale, ask your teachers to develop a, you know, take one of their units from last year and use it again this year only with um, a face-to-face -face component. Um, the other challenge, the other question that um, we had hoped to ask our participants tonight was how can we help? What do you need from us? Where can we take you um, through, through this year, through the Digital Learning Collab to really make it so that, you know, this is relevant and, and what you need to learn. And so if you do have ideas or suggestions on how the Nevada Department of Education can help, please feel free to email Brian or myself. Um, we have experience in the field and, um, you know, expertise comes from all of us. So if we don't have the answers, we can definitely work together with other people across the state who are doing things right and across the country. So um, we do appreciate you for tuning in and listening to us. And um, we look forward to having some participants join us in our next webinar. So thank you.